the beautiful landscape of Oklahoma has undergone enormous changes over time. 400 million years ago, its vast prairies were once the bed of an ancient sea. 100 million years ago, as the seas vanished, the land nourished great populations of the giant reptiles known as dinosaurs. From the fossilized remains of these magnificent creatures to the artifacts left by ancestral Native Americans, this land has unveiled evidence of life as rich in its diversity and drama as that found anywhere on Earth. The Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History houses these and other exquisite collections that have accumulated for more than a century. But it is only recently that they were brought to this state-of-the-art facility where they will be protected and preserved for future generations. These great treasures are safe now, but their long journey here was a stormy and perilous one. In 1899, the Oklahoma Territorial Legislature mandated the founding of a natural history museum at what is now the University of Oklahoma. Albert H. Van Vliet was chosen as the first curator, and in just a few years, his expeditions with geologist Charles Newton Gould built up the first significant collections. Tragically, on January 6, 1903, the museum's valuable collections were entirely destroyed when the old science hall went up in flames. Catastrophic fires plagued the museum's early years. In 1916, and again in 1918, valuable collections were lost when fires ravaged the buildings in which they were held. In 1930, paleontologist J. Willis Stovall came to the University of Oklahoma, and in 1943, he became the museum's first director. Franklin D. Roosevelt's WPA project greatly facilitated Stovall's summer field expeditions. Working for several years with a crew of more than 30 men, Stovall gathered thousands of specimens of dinosaurs, other reptiles, and mammals. I met Dr. Stovall and knew him, of course, as long as he was uh, alive. I know that he did make a number of very significant discoveries of fossil specimens. Many of them, I know, were finds of certain kinds of animals for the first time. And he had the duty of describing them for other people and publishing on them and making them known. All of the various departments which had collections took care of their own collection. Anthropologies was in the basement of the law barn and under the stadium and in South Bay scattered. Geologies was the same way. They had some in their building and they had some of theirs scattered. Zoology was the same situation. A uh, restroom, so to speak, for students to go there and stay was taken over by all of these exhibits of the finest material. And the rest of the material was underneath, the, stored underneath the stadium. That was the only place they had for that. And there was an overflow in some of the buildings on South Campus at that time. The old ROTC building was abandoned by the ROTC, and there were two parallel buildings, one to the north and one to the south, where they used to keep their guns and the other one which served as a stable for their horses. Dr. Stovall saw that as the opportunity to pull some of these collections together and really create a museum. But it still was not big enough for everything. Stovall and the directors who followed him envisioned a larger, more suitable building for the museum. As the years passed, the collections grew to more than five million artifacts, while storage conditions continued to deteriorate. Many tried to acquire new facilities, but funds were needed elsewhere and all attempts were thwarted. So the old ROTC building, 
which had been renamed the Stovall Museum, remained the collection's home. For a great many years, the museum's situation remained stagnant. Finally, changes began to take place in 1983 with the appointment of a new director. When I arrived, I was astounded at the dismal facilities that the museum had. In fact, on, on the interview, I think I shocked people by telling them that this place was really a dump. And how could they live like this? But I was very straightforward with them. This was an intolerable situation. And at the time I interviewed, I had no idea of the extent or value of the collections or the beauty and importance of the objects uh, in the collections. So I was responding just from the point of view of a person who knew museums and knew collections and knew that they shouldn't be kept this way. We had buildings that were just atrocious uh, beyond uh, any museum in the country. They would train firemen in our buildings because the, they were fire traps that had projected burn down times of seven minutes. They, they set the standard for poor facilities. They were at one time stables and barns, some of them. And in these buildings, people had placed the, the largest treasure of the state of Oklahoma. I came in fall of 1986. That collection had been in mothballs for decades. Some of the stuff had actually never been unpacked from field wrappings that uh, when they were collected in the 1930s. Uh, the collection was just an unholy mess. It was unbelievable. Things were mixed up, broken, missing. They were just, uh, it was just a disaster. Uh, these big, big uh, wooden boxes, just things just stacked like cordwood. The Olympic Festival was scheduled to celebrate Oklahoma's centennial, 1889 to 1989. We had been coming off the presidential elections at the time, so uh, George Bush was president, Ronald Reagan had stepped down, and Ronald Reagan was the keynote speaker uh, here at the festival. The geographic location of the old buildings is that they were right across the street from the football stadium. And so the Olympic Festival was being held in the football stadium. The person in charge of uh, the University Police Department um, saw me and came over to the table and said, you know, hey, we're going to have to get you guys to move your trucks on, you know, two Saturdays from now or something. And I said, wow, why? Oh, well, because we're going to be shooting off all those fireworks in the parking lot, you know, just to the east of you. And we had never heard anything about this. And so we, uh, uh, my, the first thing I did after lunch was come back and tell, tell Dr. Mares and say, do you know about this fireworks deal? I mean, here we are in fire traps and they're going to, you know, 30 feet away from us, fire off $40,000 worth of fireworks in five minutes. It turned out that they were going to have the largest fireworks display in the history of the state of Oklahoma to celebrate the centennial. I just want to say that you Oklahoma folks know how to throw a party, don't you? I tried to get some people maybe to change their minds about doing the fireworks. There were more than a thousand rockets uh, placed in a little fenced area up against our building. I called the Attorney General and they could, he was out of town traveling and so I said, well, find him because we've got a situation here. In any case, one of the assistant vice presidents called and then one of the vice presidents called and uh, they said, what can we do to allow this festival to go forward and to stop you from getting a restraining order. I figured they were going to fire me anyway, but I was going to get this order and stop the, the fireworks. So I told them we, we would develop a plan and, and we said all the windows of all the buildings had to be nailed shut. Uh, we had to have the fire department come in and uh, set up uh, hoses that would hose down the buildings. There had to be firemen on every, on every rooftop, fire trucks at every building. And when the festival went off, they would be out there ready to fight fires. So on the opening ceremonies, they arrived with their fire trucks and um, basically already put ladders up on our building because they felt the same way we did, that it was something that could really be disastrous. And they gave us hard hats to wear and we stationed ourselves in, in various places uh, around the different buildings. I, I feel like it was almost like the Civil War, you know, I remember it was so loud and it was so bright that you really felt like you were being bombed. I mean, we almost, I mean, we felt responsible for our 
for our area, but we also felt like we're going to be killed. I mean, we really took cover. crying as they walked around because they were stunned and then eventually the fire started falling from the sky as the ashes came and uh, no, burning embers started to fall all over the buildings and the grass and uh, one rocket went awry and, and went into a tree right next to one of our buildings and the tree burst into flames and there was a fireman there and he just turned his hose on it and we had water running over all the buildings. Uh, some of the bombs came down unexploded. That was a very long night. Tremendous tension, and all of the fires that started, the firemen um, uh, put them out. There were grass fires, there were you know, uh, fires that had uh, begun on the roof, they'd put out right away. As these flaming ashes landed, the tree that burst into flames was put out. And within about 15 minutes, the, the uh, excitement was over, and, and the buildings were all drenched, and we were drenched too as we walked around, and people were hugging each other. And it was a very dramatic moment. We had saved the buildings. Uh, the next day we made a great uh, dinosaur cake for the fire department. We would have lost that night the Spiro collection, the archaeology collection, those two alone are about three million objects, the bird collection, the mammal collection, the collection of microfossils, micropaleontology, the vertebrate paleontology collection, all of the dinosaurs, all of the materials that were on exhibit, which were some of the treasures, the classics collection, the ethnology collection. All of the records for all of the collections that have been made over a hundred years, all the locality data, any kind of research we had done on the materials, uh, all of the Chinese collections, the Asian collections, the South Pacific collections, each of those would have disappeared because flames came down from the sky on each of those buildings. Yeah.